So, thank you uh, Good morning, everybody. We are today, as I said last time, in the middle already of the advanced part of the lecture, because we've looked at the basics and built all the building blocks, such as Boolean retrieval and the standard inverted index. And now we are starting to optimize and um, try to improve our information retrieval system. And the way that we started improving it, and that I started last week, was by trying to compress, um, to compress uh, the uh, index. Uh, you probably remember that I asked you a question last week about what kind of compression we've already been doing without being aware of it, but we've already been doing it. And one of the questions involved term IDs, if you remember, and I wanted to refresh your memory with this question. Why is it that we introduced term IDs in the previous lecture, index construction? In index construction, for the blocked source space indexing, we introduced term IDs. Why did we do that? Why was it necessary? We could just have used terms, right? We've always been doing that since the beginning of the lecture. We used the terms in the inverted index. So why are you using, why are we using term IDs? So is it because we need some kind of efficient B tree or B plus tree comparison methods in order to look up the terms and it's much more efficient if we have term IDs because it's just integer comparison as opposed to lexicographic comparison with strings? Or is it because that way we can compress the final standard inverted index and make it smaller? because it has term IDs, not terms. Or is it because the postings, you know, the document IDs in the standard inverted index, would take too much space on memory and on disk while you're sorting? Uh, or maybe it is because the postings must be stored in fixed size in order to efficiently retrieve blocks. So which one is it? We have 12 answers so far. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh -huh. 13. Can you please raise your hands if you need more time, if you're not done yet? Okay, then let me show the answer. Yes, you're correct. It has to do with uh, the fact that, remember, in the, sort, in the blocked sort-based indexing, what are we doing? We are parsing the documents in blocks, not everything at the same time, but we are taking blocks of documents, shards of documents, and we're extracting the postings from these documents. And it is these postings that we are going in memory to sort uh, in a way that we prepare for the final inverted index. And these postings, remember, they are pairs uh, that uh, contain a term and a document ID, right? So there's a lot of duplicates because you may have plenty of time the same terms, the same terms appearing in multiple places. So if you replace these with term IDs and elsewhere maintain the mapping with the terms, you're going to have the term just once in the mapping and then the term IDs plenty of times, but this is much shorter. So this is the correct answer. The first one is completely made up. I didn't even manage to make it look serious when I, when I uh, came up with something uh, fake. Uh, the second one, no, we saw last week that we are not compressing the final standard inverted index because this one still has the terms. Right? The term IDs are only temporary during the index construction. And the last one, uh, this is something we are going to do now. Uh, we are going to see why we are trying to use variable length encoding for the uh, compression techniques. So yes, that was the correct answer. You did well. And I have a second one. I wanted to ask it last week, but I didn't. What is the difference? Because I keep saying postings, and at the start of the semester, I kept telling you a token is a posting, a token is a posting, a token is a posting. I kept telling you that. And then suddenly, last week, you probably noticed that I started saying, you know, in some cases, uh, the token may not be exactly one posting. So I would like to uh, come back to that and explain exactly what's going on here and why a token and a posting may actually slightly differ. And this is why here I'm very careful saying non-positional posting as opposed to positional posting. So I'm asking for the difference. What is the difference between a token and a non-positional posting? So 
So is it that when you have a non-positional posting, it can correspond to multiple tokens in a document because the same term can appear, can appear plenty of times in a document. So you're going to have just one single non-positional posting, but you may have multiple occurrences of it. So it's one to n. Or does a token correspond to multiple non-positional postings because multiple documents can contain the same term. So a term can appear in multiple documents. Or is there no difference? A token and a non-positional posting are exactly the same thing. It's a term document pair. Or is there no difference because both tokens and non-positional postings, they all correspond to exactly one occurrence of a term in a document. So normally you have everything you need from the lecture to answer this question. But I think it's worth spending a few minutes on that to be extremely clear. Let me close. Yes, you got it right as well. And now let me clarify. To be extremely preci precise of the world. Here. So we have documents that contain term. And a term can appear in the original document. When you look at the original text, the same token, let's say token T, token T can appear multiple times in that document, let's say three times. But what we've been doing in the first week, we've been simplifying that. We have been saying we ignore two things. We ignore the order in which the tokens appear. That's the first thing we ignore. The second thing we ignore is the number of occurrences of the tokens. In other words, we simplify a document as being just a set of terms. So it's the set of words, set of terms, simplification. So uh, it's a set of terms. And based on that, we've built the standard inverted index where we have terms here and the terms are associated with a linked list of document IDs. And this is what we call postings, you probably remember. We should have called them, I on purpose did it not to simplify things, it's a non-positional posting. Non-positional just because I told you we ignore the position, we ignore the occurrences, so non-positional posting. And a non-positional posting is a pair term document. That's what it is, it's a pair made of a term and a document. So you can see that this here, let's say this is document one here, and here we have the document ID one. So here you only see one. What this is actually is the pair T1. It's just that we only write T once, but this is actually the pair T1. So this is a non-positional posting. And you can see that for this non-positional posting, you have three tokens in the original documents, one, two, three, because the token is actually an occurrence. So I oversimplified things at first in the lecture, and so did the book. But you remember that at some point we started doing phrase search. And when we started doing phrase search, we introduced the positional index. And in the, posi the positional index, we starting, let's say this is position 6, 13, 20, we started also adding here the positions. And these are now positional postings every time. It's a term document position triple positional posting. So now, be careful to distinguish non-positional posting, positional posting. That's exactly the reason why in the book, at some places, and I think even in the slides that we saw last week, at some places, I think it should be somewhere here. Uh, I don't know if it was actually done here. Exactly. So here, I, we've already seen that last week, it's the impact of the compression techniques we've been seeing so far on the statistics. And I had three slides here. First, the impact on the number of terms, which is the impact on this. How can we impact how big the dictionary is? That was the first slide, number of terms. Second slide, number of postings, and it's actually meant here non-positional postings. It's the standard inverted index where you ignore the position. It's the size of this, right, these postings here. And the third slide, tokens in the sense of positional postings. So this is why 
there's less terms than postings because you have more pairs of term documents than terms and you have more tokens than non-positional postings because on top you have the position so it's even bigger who understands this okay so we're counting three things the, t the terms the non-positional postings and the positional postings this is exactly the terminology that is used in the book and now you are able to distinguish between the three okay very good so now let me continue with the lecture just recap a little bit what we've been doing and also clarify something so we've been seeing we've been seeing two statistics law two two um, two general laws of distributions of statistics and actually it's so interesting that you're going to have exercises on this the week after that we, you're going to try by yourself to actually get these plots out of the Shakespeare corpus so we first saw Heap's law that is if you if you keep adding documents and documents and documents how many distinct terms will you get right and the answer is what is the curve that is here it's square root yes I'm hearing square root exactly so I even asked the question and we obtained the square root k square root of t and I, I also want to make something precise here even it was already correct last week but at some point I realized here I had number of documents that I was calling it t and I was like why did I call it t the answer is very simple actually this very often this law is actually expressed in terms of the number of tokens uh, so the number of terms compared to the number of tokens it's exactly the same curve if you assume that the documents have similar sizes then the number the, the number of documents is just a constant times the number of tokens right but here just to be very consistent with the book we are using t here t is the number of tokens okay who understands this and who understands it's the same curve if we use documents instead you assuming the, the documents have a constant uh, or constant length okay so this is heaps law uh, it's very straightforward to do you will see programmatically you just need to pass the documents tokenize and then compute the distinct and then you get the curve out of this and the second distribution that we obtained that we obtained was tips flow um, tips law is about the distribution of terms when you rank them by um, by uh, frequency so we went from the very frequent terms to the less frequent terms and then we observe that of course it decreases it's, it's it's by construction that it decreases because we sorted them so of course it decreases but the question is how does it decrease what is the uh, the uh, equation here and very interestingly it's one over x it's just the inverse hyperbole hyperbolic curve and uh, you can see on the log log scale both the heap slow and the tip slow are linear on a log log scale because it's just an exponential uh, even though it's one half of minus one as exponents but it's still exponential so we have a log log scale uh, okay so no sorry what I am saying I'm not I'm saying exponential I don't mean exponential I mean um, um, square root and minus one so it's uh, it's uh, power okay so we had this which is tip slow so this is a hyperbolic curve okay we will reduce it today uh, at the end when we run some computations so remember this one also would you who would be capable of uh, plotting this if I give you the Shakespeare corp corpus most of you well you'll, you'll have it as an exercise so we, you will be uh, doing it by yourself um, so then we saw that we already know compression techniques removing numbers putting everything lowercase removing stop words and uh, stemming lemmatization and so on and then I already show it today we saw that it does impact the size of the dictionary the size of the standard inverted index and the, the, the size of a positional uh, index as well okay so now we are going to uh, compress the index and uh, let me see if I have questions regarding this maybe I wait a bit so let's start compressing the index um, this is our standard inverted index and we just we are going to 
take it from there, very easy, just this one, nothing complicated, no byword index, k-gram index, uh, positional postings and so on, just the standard one of the first week of the lecture where we have the terms here, or the types if you, you use stemming and lemmatization, and then you have these lists of document IDs and recollect that every time this is a pair with the term and the documents, so these are the postings. Perfect, and here we have the document frequencies. It's just the count of the number of postings in there. One, two, three, four, so we have a four here. So what can we compress? We can compress two things. We can either try to compress this, or we can try to compress that. Why do we want to compress? I mean, I'm telling you we're compressing this, but why? What do we get if we compress? Yes? Uh, on the disks and? And in memory. Yeah, exactly, in memory. And in memory is the one thing that matters the most to us. If we are able to compress this, we can fit much more into memory. So we can have bigger collections in memory. And this is something, and now I'm saying that not just for information retrieval, but also for databases in general, and even for big data applications, when you have like large numbers of clusters, do not underestimate the importance of having an index that fits in memory. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have indices that do not fit in memory, and then you just save it on disk. Uh, it's the case of B-trees, for example. Sometimes B-tree indices are very big, but the B-trees are very nicely done, so you have the upper layers of the B-tree in memory, and then the lower layers that are on disks. But it's so because the whole point of having, having an index is to make it faster. So if you have to look up the index and go through the disk, this is much slower. If you are able to have the entire index in memory, this is much faster, right? So this is the one reason why fitting an index into memory, not just this one, but any index that you have in database systems, this makes queries much faster. Um, okay? So let's try, there's two things we can compress, either this, or this. We can either try to compress the terms, so the dictionary, or we can try to compress the postings, and this gives us two parts for this lecture, so let's start with compressing the dictionary. So the status quo, as we saw, is that the dictionary is stored as a B plus tree, which is the way of efficiently searching it, because remember that when we introduced the standard inverted index, I just told you we have the dictionary on the left, and it took two more weeks for me to actually tell you that what is on the left is actually using a B plus three or a hash, uh, a hash index to make it faster. So this is actually when I show you the standard inverted index. See, here? What you see here is actually this physically. You actually have it as a B tree. So the way that you look up the, uh, the dictionary is by making plenty of comparison and going down the tree, and then you find it. And then when you find, for example, here, this word, you have a link to the, uh, a pointer to the posting list, right? And possibly this part here is in memory, as I told you, but this part here, down, may be on disk, because that's too big. So this is what we want to change. Right, this is just illustrating what I just said. So we are going to start compressing this, because if we manage to compress this, then everything will be in memory, and maybe or actually we are going to even drop the B-tree. We are going to use binary search instead. Why? Because it's in memory, so it's actually uh, just uh, as fast. Okay, so let's try to compress the dictionary, and that way, if we manage to compress the dictionary, this may still be on disk, we may still have the postings on disk, we take care of them later, but this part here will fit in memory, so we are going to be able to be much faster in looking up terms. Okay, so a first approach, I'm starting with very, na very naive approaches because um, I don't know how much you've been exposed so far to building systems or building something. The, the, the thing you always start with is correctness. First you get something correct, it doesn't matter if it's low, and then you improve on that. So here I'm doing a little bit the same. I start with a very naive solution. Uh, what if we store everything as a race here, but we compress in that we don't have this uh, this arbitrary length, but we stick to, for example, 20 characters. So here we say it's fixed length. And then we, we can very efficiently store that in memory. It's all structured. We know exactly the, the position of the nth term because it's constant length. And then we store the document frequencies, and then we have some pointers to where the posting leaks, le, uh, 
lists are, be it on memory or on. So we have this approach. I would barely call it compressed, actually. I mean, it doesn't even deserve the term compressed. But this is just something to start with. <coughs> so how big is that? <coughs> so I said 20 characters here. Uh, do not count here. It's probably less, less than 20, but just assume 20. 20 bytes here, 4 bytes here, and 4 bytes here. Uh, here I'm also oversimplifying, assuming some ASCII, like I, I don't consider UTF-8 or something, just to simplify. So we have 28 bytes every time. Um, but here's the thing. Um, it doesn't work because we may have very long terms. Uh, we, may, we may have this. Uh, I'm not even capable of uh, pronouncing this. It's from a famous movie. It doesn't fit in there. So this is not acceptable. It could make our life easier because it's very easy to look up with binary search here. But we may have issues when we have terms that begin the same. So this is not an acceptable solution. Um, here's a second approach. The second approach is we store the terms entirely, meaning variable length. We just, if it's two letters, well, it's two letters. If it's 80 letters, then it's 80 letters. We just store them like this in memory, one after the other. And now we are maintaining here just this structure for the, the dictionary. We have the document frequency here for each term, but we no longer have the, have the terms stored here. We still have the pointers to the postings, to the posting lists in there. And what do we have here? The third column. Anybody? Yes? Yes, the second is right. The, the index where it starts, aka pointer. Exactly. So we have for every row, we have a, 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 an offset, so a pointer, that tells us exactly when it starts and ends. So you, you see that in order to know where it starts and ends, you need the pointer of the row and the next pointer. And with this pointer and this pointer, it delimits exactly here ETH. So this is the way you can uh, store it. It's still not very compressed, but at least it's better because we don't have the issue of uh, having limited to a certain number of bytes for each term. So this is already a better approach, and you don't need this big, uh, this, a, a lot of space in there because it's, it's not that big here. So you can, you can even make do with three bytes uh, already. So you can gain some space uh, over here. And by the way, why is it actually smaller than the, the former one, because you're going to tell me that we still store the terms here. And here we store the terms as well. So why is this smaller? So it's smaller here, and it's smaller here. Why? Okay, let me tell you, if you look in the books, they did it with uh, Reuters RCD1 corpus. The average length uh, of, um, of a term is actually something around seven or eight. Right, so the average here, each term is going to be seven or eight uh, um, bytes in average, which is less than 20, because when we went, we went brute force in there storing 20, that takes a lot of space. So here we are like twice, twice as big. So we have this, in average, eight bytes here, and three to point, but that's 11, it's less than 20. So this is smaller. We already are doing slightly better here. We can do even better. This is now a third approach. We don't need to actually store all of the pointers there. We can skip some. So every k terms, so here I'm doing it every three terms. So I only store a pointer of every k terms. So I have three divided by k bytes. I have k times less bytes needed here. Okay, I don't, I don't store all of them. So you can call these blocks. You can, you can see these as blocks. Um, so what do we have here? Now we still store the string, but we do need now, and this is actually also the correct answer that you gave earlier, that you can store the length here every time. So you start saying there's eight bytes here. I'm not large enough. I, I would need almost a scale in order to make it. So we have eight bytes here, then three, one, two, three, then four, one, two, three, four. Okay, so you need one more. So this is why you have nine bytes here, not eight, but nine. So you add one more. But you reduce here, so overall this is actually shorter. And if you increase k, it's going to be smaller and smaller and smaller. 
So how do you look up here? You use binary search, right? You, so it's, it's all, uh, it's all um, sorted in there. You, you can see it's sorted alphabetically. So you, you, if you look up a term, you start in the middle with a middle block, look in there what you have here and go on the left or on the right. It's a logical B tree, it's just that it's not implemented as a B tree, but you're basically simulating the B tree by doing binary search. You understand this? Okay, and then you, at some point you will see find where it is in there, and if you see, for example, here it's the second one, you're looking for CPU, then you know you pick the second one here, document frequency five, and here you get the postings with that pointer, okay? So this is already much smaller. We managed to uh, compress a bit more. Um, overall, there is no free lunch. So you have to be aware that we did some compression, so we had some standard inverted index here, uh, with the dictionary and we compress the dictionary to something smaller so we fit more into memory. What is the cost of this? It's the speed, right? When you query, exactly. So the price you have to pay because there's, there's very rarely a free lunch is uh, you need more time at query time. Why do you need more time? Because the binary search works on the blocks, you can use binary search and have a logarithmic performance for finding the block where you are. But within the block, you have to scan it. So the bigger the blocks, the more linear it starts getting. So you, you no longer have this logarithmic uh, improvement in there, right? So you have to find a compromise between space and time, and this is why you need to adjust k. You need to adjust the size of these blocks that you are making here. And if you do an analysis on that, you may see a B tree here, but again, I only told you it's a simulation of a B tree, so it's only a modeling of the binary search we are doing. So if you are looking for data, for example, I compare with ETH right in the middle, then go to the left, CPU, data, and so on. This is k equals one. If k equals one, that's, that was the, the, the approach too, then this is how the binary search looks like. It is optimal, it's logarithmic. It's, it's exactly the, the best we can get. We have one extra memory seek. Here we have two extra memory seeks in order. So we need a memory seek every time, right? When we do a comparison, a step of the bi binary search needs a memory seek. So one, two memory uh, seeks. So on average, if we take all the nodes here, zero, one, one, two, 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 then the average is 1.4. And now if we block, this is what it starts looking like. If you do blocks of three, you're going to have more something like EDH, but then you need to scan linearly. So you no longer have this fully logarithmic uh, performance. And here you see CPU needs two extra memory six, but this one here needs two ex three extra memory six. So you need to um, first compare with the binary search, and then once you've found the block, you need to navigate linearly through the block, so it's more memory six. So what happens if we do the average 1.7? So you, saw, you see, we lost a bit of performance at query time, but what we got is we fit more into memory so we can index more documents. Understand this? Okay, very good. There is yet another approach which goes even farther because yes, we can compress even more. Remember that this here is sorted alphabetically who sees that there's gonna be a lot of duplicates or a lot of repetition? Yes, some of you. Because if you look into a dictionary, uh, let's say you look for compute, so you're going to find computation, compute, computer, computing, right? This, and this is what you get in the sequence here. So you must feel that we can do something about it, right? Because this compute, so C-O-M-P-U-T part is repeated every time and only the N changes. So why don't we store it just once and then we store the, pref the suffixes? That's exactly the idea of the next step, which is that here it, it's a different example than the one I showed with automata, automate, automatic, automation. And here you have this special character. So you encode the prefix, the shared prefix. Then you have this special character that tells you now this is a prefix that you keep in mind, and then compute auto automata, automate, and you have this special character that replaces the prefix, automate, automatic, automation. This is called front coding. Who sees that this is smaller? Takes less space, awesome. And here, that's exactly what we are doing here. 
So of course, if you want to do the binary search, you may only want to use that within a block and start it all over again for the next block, right? So it's not trivial because you need to identify the prefixes. So I didn't say it's trivial, but what I'm saying is you can do that if you find the right prefixes and you're able to gain some place here. So here you have less bytes and here still the same pointers. So this is front coding. So now uh, the next step is to look at, with all these techniques that we've been use, we're using, what impact does it have on the dictionary size? Did we manage to compress? So again, the book did it with Reuters RCV1. With a collection of 960 megabytes, I think this, this the, the time, just keep in mind, the book was written around 20, 2007. So the memory size at that time was much smaller than today, right? Um, we could only dream of terabytes of memory uh, 10 years ago. So of course, the numbers are a little bit smaller, but it is the spirit. So fixed width, it's, it's 20 bytes uh, terms, the 20 bytes uh, terms uh, size that we first tried, approach one. We get a dictionary size of 11.2 megabytes. Then, if we try to use unique string, a unique string with all terms concatenated and then the pointers to it, it goes down to 7.6 megabytes. So we are doing better as anticipated. If we use blocking, remember blocking means we don't put a pointer every time, we skip every time k rows in order to put a new pointer. Even better, not that much, but we still get down to 7.1 megabytes. And if you use the front coding, then you have 5.9. So you can see you fit twice as much into the memory because now you gained, you gained half of the size and you can fit yet another 900 megabytes of documents uh, in the index, right? So this is pretty good, right? It means that it works. We are able to compress. Of course, it's not, you, you know, in some companies, they say uh, that you should only be proud and announce that you managed to do an improvement if it's at least a factor of 10. So of course, we don't have a factor of 10 here, but still, you can fit more into memory. So this, this matters a lot. So this was the first part on the dictionary compression. What we are compressing here is the dictionary. It's the part on the left. And I think I had a few questions prepared here. Uh, yeah, just this one that I kept for the transition. So we saw a bit of construction techniques again last uh, week and the week before. We saw BSBI, we saw SPIMI, SPIMI, MapReduce, and logarithmic merging, and a few more, but this is, these are more or less the main four. So now let it, let's try to put this together. Let's try to use these techniques of index construction and at the same time use compression techniques. Can we also improve here? So it means we can use compression not just to fit the index in memory, but also if it's larger to actually help with the construction method. So just try to think and tell me where do you think it's going to help with the index construction? That it becomes more efficient, we can fit more, um, and it's going to improve the construction. Will it improve BSBI, blocked sort-based indexing? Will it improve SPIMI? What does SPIMI mean? Yes? Single pass in memory indexing, exactly. Very good. Then we had the MapReduce technique where we spread over a cluster of machines. Uh, BSBI and SPIMI are in a single machine, right? So you can, of course, parallelize a bit if you want, but in spirit, it's a single machine. MapReduce spreads it over multiple machines, and logarithmic merging was when you indexed online with documents that kept this. Okay, so tell me, if we use these uh, index compression techniques, the dictionary compression, but also the postings compression, if we manage to compress the postings.
I think I got it right, but normally there's multiple answers allowed. So it's not just only one answer. You may pick several. Eleven. We'll get to fifteen. Twelve. Three more. Fourteen. Yes. Let me not close quite now. Let me just seventeen. Very good. Interesting. Yeah. So these were the correct answers. So SPIMI you got, that's the majority. Because wh why does it help with SPIMI? Do you remember when in the first step of SPIMI, when, so we shard the collection of documents into smaller charts, and for each shard, for each set of documents, what do we build in memory? So in BSBI, what we build in memory is just a set of postings, right? Pairs of terms and documents, we shuffle them and sort them. But in SPIMI, what do we have in memory? What do we maintain when we process the block of documents? Do you remember that? Anybody? Yes? Exactly, the index directly. So the index directly, just for the set of documents that we are uh, working on, but we do maintain the entire index. So do you see that with these compression techniques, we can diminish the size of these intermediate results, of these intermediate indices. So it means that we can have bigger blocks, right? We can, we can fit more into one single step in the memory and then write it back to disk. And also on disk, it's going to take less, less space. Um, Logarithmic merging, it's the same. We also have the, the inverted indices, right? This is what we have every time, just bigger and bigger and bigger, if you remember what we did. But it's also the standard inverted indices. So also here, we can, have, we can fit more in the same amount of space. Now, can somebody tell me why for BSBI and MapReduce, I'm not saying there's zero improvement, right? It's like a rule of thumb, but you cannot really get that much gain of efficiency compared to SPIMI and logarithmic merging. Why? So let me ask the question differently. Um, what do both BSBI and MapReduce manipulate? Yes? So y this is what it does. So this is the manipulation. Yeah. What is the manipulee? What is being manipulated, if I may say so? It's not the standard inverted index, which is what I'm coming at. But what do we manipulate instead? The postings, the postings exactly. And we, we maintain the postings in their raw form. We really maintain them as pairs of terms and documents. So we don't optimized by only storing the term once and then just the documents. We really have the pairs of terms and documents. Both in MapReduce and in BSBI, uh, we have this. So you can see that what I showed you, the dictionary compression, it only works if you really have the dictionary, you, you know, as a linear uh, without repetitions and sorted alphabetically and so on. But when you have the postings, you cannot use that. It doesn't work. And what I'm going to show you, the, the next part of the lecture in the second hour, if you try to reduce the, the, the postings, to compress the postings, this is also useless. Because it only works if you really have lists of document IDs that you can compress. It's amazing how you can compress that. It's one of my favorite parts of the lecture. Um, but you cannot use these compression techniques when you're really manipulating the, the raw pairs of term document IDs. So you cannot do anything here. Uh, oh, by the way, I want to take the opportunity to say a little thing. Um, if you read the book, who, who does read the book? hope it's increasing every week. Right, very good. I'm very glad you do. So if you read the book um, and see the way that they describe BSBI, um, this is also what I thought because I, I'm trying to stick to the book. You probably noticed when they explain, uh, after processing all these postings in memory and sorting them and so on and so on, the way it's explained in the book is that you build a standard inverted index accumulating the um, 
the posting with the same terms together and store it on disk. And then there's even a picture in the book that, so, that um, shows you how the merge is done. So you're actually essentially merging standard inverted indices, right? Um, however, uh, you must know that the, the original essence of BSBI was to actually not directly store the standard inverted index, at least not until the end. What was stored in the, in the raw nature of BSBI is still the postings. So you, in the first step, you pass the documents, get the postings into memory, sort the postings by terms uh, and document IDs, and then store the raw postings back on disk. And at the end, you would get back the uh, sorted postings from disk and then merge them. It's nothing else than merge sort, actually, if you consider that, and then build the standard inverted index. And this is something I noticed because I found some other document by one of the authors of the book um, in uh, some of the lecture he was giving, and then he changed this illustration of the merge. And in that illustration, he was actually merging list of postings and no longer a pre-computed standard inverted index. So the reason I'm saying that is be aware of that, that there's kind of BSBI version one and BSBI version two. So just do not be confused uh, because of that. Just keep that in mind. Um, and of course, at the exam, I try to be clear. So I'm not going to put a trap where you have to use arbitrarily one or the other, right? But just be aware that uh, th there is BSBI one and BSBI two. And actually, with the BSBI one, so the version where you actually store the intermediate results as raw postings, SPIMI is an improvement over that, and this is exactly the justification of SPIMI to no longer use the term IDs. Because you can see that if you want to store in BSBI the raw postings as intermediate results, then having the term IDs is extremely useful. Because if you store the raw postings, you, you will have smaller ones because you're using the term IDs in the pairs. Who understands this? Right? And this is exactly why in SPIMI, because we directly store the standard inverted index, we don't care about the term IDs anymore. Why? Because in the standard inverted index, each term appears just once. So this is why we don't need the term IDs. That was my question at the beginning. Okay, very good. That was a parenthesis. And the MapReduce is exactly the same thing. Remember, what do we manipulate in MapReduce? It's also the postings. Remember that we were, so we also sharp the documents and then we have a thousand machines and each machine is reading one thousandth of the collection. And then what happens is that in the mapping phase, you generate pairs. You generate always key value pairs in MapReduce and you generate pairs that have a term and a document. So what you shuffle around in MapReduce is again the raw postings. So this is why the compression technique does not help at all with MapReduce because again, we cannot compress the raw postings. We can only compress the dictionary or the posting lists themselves, and by posting lists, I mean just the document IDs, okay? But this we will do with the second part of the lecture, so right after the break, I will show you how you can, the, the amazing and brilliant techniques that you can use in order to compress the, uh, the posting lists of the standard inverted index. So uh, let me just stop here for, the, uh, for, for now. Let's take a break, and uh, we'll be back at uh, quarter past in order to tackle the uh, posting list compression. It's 10.15, so let's start the second part of the lecture and now go to the compression of posting lists. So we've already compressed this. We've seen many ways of doing that. We did quite well to compress one half of it on the uh, analyzed data set. And now we are going to compress this instead. So remember, this is very important. These are postings. These are term document pairs. But here we only store the documents because the term is logically and implicitly there. So what we actually have here is just list of integers. That's it. A document ID is an integer. We have lists of integers. So the question is, how do we compress lists of integers? This is the uh, mathematically formal way of putting what we are going to do now. So imagine that we have a list like this, and we want to compress it. So first, let's ask ourselves 
what is the state of the arts? Or at least how are we doing naively without thinking about compression? Well, if we don't think about compression, we are going to take some type. If it's in Java or Python, we can maybe take 32 bytes, uh, 32 bytes, 32 bits, a 32 bit integer. This allows us to store how many documents? You don't know your powers of two. You should know your powers of two. Two to the power of 32. Do you know how to quickly compute a power of two? You notice that two to the power of 10 is almost 10 to the power of three. So two to the power of 32, the three gives you the number of groups of three zeros. So it's a billion. And then two gives you four. So it's four billion. So you can store four billion Documents with four bytes. 64, 64 bits would be an overkill. I mean, I'm very careful with what I'm saying because somebody said in the 80s that 640K of memory is enough for everybody, but you never know. So this is how we could do it. If we have less than 65,000 documents, maybe you can use two bytes instead, just 16 bits. But you can see that, you know, maybe that's not the most efficient because we may have a few documents, uh, like for example, if you start document one, it's basically 31 zeros and then a one. So it's not very efficient. But on the other hand, if you really have four billion documents, then you cannot really do much better. Or can't you? Maybe you can. So this is the exact number. You don't have to learn it by heart. I won't ask it at the exam. Can we encode with less space? And the answer is yes. Can somebody, looking at this, tell me about a way we could encode this in a better way than by encoding each one of these, um, each one of these uh, integers on four bytes, or even two bytes, in that case? Can anybody see a pattern here or something that we can optimize? Yes? Yes, so what you're essentially saying is front coding. Exactly the same technique as we used for the dictionary, the last one, right? The front coding, where you store one zero once and then 56, 58, 63, and so on. This is exactly the idea. Um, this is exactly the idea of what we are going to do. Um, you're looking at these numbers as strings. Can you look at them as numbers and try to find a variance that mathematically is even simpler? Imagine that I do have 1,056. I have 1,056 that's already stored. What information do I need to get the other ones? What, what information do I need to get to 1,058? I just need to add two, right? And two takes less space to encode than 1,058. I'm making a very bold statement here that two takes less space. It's not always true, but you will understand very soon why I'm saying that. So the idea, it's a variant of what you said. It's exactly the right idea that instead of encoding here very naively on 16 bits here, doing it on 16 bits, I encode these ones. You can see that there's a lot of redundancy because here the gaps are very small. So instead of encoding each integer, I'm simply going, noticing there are small gaps. I'm encoding the gaps instead. And that's it. So here, I have the original number. This one I encode. And I, maybe I can do like a first try saying, OK, the gaps are very small. They are less than 16. So I can use just four bits in there. And that takes less space. So here I encode two, five, one, and three. And we gain some space. Who agrees with that? Very good. But now, this works. If we have terms that appear very frequently, because if we have a term out of 4 billion documents, if a term appears, let's say, in 1 billion documents, you can s reasonably assume that it's evenly spread across the documents and there's going to be very small gaps. 
maybe, of course, because of the central limit theorem, some of the gaps will be bigger and so on, but on the whole, on average, the gaps will be small. But remember that because of the tips law, right, not all the terms are frequent. What do we do with a term that only appears three or four times in four billion documents, or even just once? This will not fit on four bits because then the gaps will be much bigger. So you can see that this only partially solves the problem because we are stuck with the fixed length here. Because if we want to account for the terms that are infrequent, these terms will have bigger gaps and we are stuck with, again, 32 bits or 16 bits. And then we didn't gain anything, right? We're just going to have a lot of zeros for the frequent terms, but we didn't gain anything. So what, we'd, what we would like to have is that the encoding of these gaps here, it would be nice if it could be elastic, if it could be, if it could be smaller, if the gap is small, and if it could be bigger only if the gap is bigger. And that would be extremely efficient. Right? Because whenever we have small gaps, it doesn't take much space. When you have large gap, it takes more space. So what if we could do that? And the answer is yes, we can actually do that. And I'm going to show you how. Uh, we are going to do it step by step. So there's two, two main techniques that I'm going to show to you. The variable byte encoding and then the gamma code. These are the two techniques that we are going to see. So the variable byte encoding, what's the idea? The idea is that in a fixed length encoding, we know exactly where the boundaries are, right? Remember, when we encoded the dictionary, in this first version that I told you, every term is encoding on 20 bytes, it's very easy to know the offsets. If you know that every time, every into into is 28 bytes, so if you want to jump to the 100th one, you just multiply by 100, 28, 2,800, you know exactly what, how to jump. So if you have a fixed length, Encoding, this is extremely easy. You know where the boundaries are. Right? If you know it's 32 bits, then you just count 1, 2, 3, blah, 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 32, and then you know you stop here, and that's it. Right? But if you do not know where the boundaries are, for example, if the number of bytes here changes, then you don't know. You, you start, because all you have on disks is a stream of zeros and ones. That's all you have. So if you start reading here, there's a number of bits. You cannot possibly know where you stop. Maybe this is the end of, uh, of this one, and then the, the second one starts here. But maybe this is instead the end of this one, and the second one starts here. You have no idea. So what that means is that if you have a variable length encoding, you need some extra information. Do you remember how we solved it in the case where, when we used the, uh, the uh, dictionary compression, when we, we switched over to variable length? when we did encode the terms in variable length. Do you remember how we did it? Two ways. What's the first approach we took? Yes? Yeah, exactly. That was one of the two approaches, is you store with every term, you store the length. So it's as if in this string, we would store every time on a few bits, we would store the length of the next one. Then you have it. And the second way that we did that was with pointers in the first version. You store the pointer where it starts, and you have a second pointer that tells you where it ends, and then you have the information. So we would like to do the same kind of things in there, but we would like to do them efficiently. So how can we encode somehow the length of, the, uh, of, of every integer in a way that we can decode that, and in a way that's efficient? because of course, if it's less efficient than the fit length, then that's useless. So we need a way that we can deduce. If we look at these bits here, we should find a way that here there is some information that tells us exactly what x is and where here we are going to stop. I would like to tell you that another way of looking at that, if you take a different perspective of how do we know where it stops, there is something called prefix codes. I think pre prefix free, some people say prefix codes. The best example is phone, phone numbers. You probably noticed when you, when you take a phone, I mean, now it's all digital, so maybe you wouldn't, you wouldn't even care about these things anymore. But in the very old times of phones, um, you, you would dial, and then, so first there was a ta 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 ta, -ta like every time you had the, uh, uh, you pressed the key, it would just, uh, by the way, it's a unary code. We are going to see it later. 
Uh, or it's a frequency encoding system that whenever you press a key, you have these two frequencies, one frequency that encodes the row and the other that encodes the columns. So this is why you hear two sounds superposed when you dial. The way you dial over a phone is you pick up the phone, you hear some signal, then you start dialing. But if you stop in the middle of a, of a number, nothing happens. And then once you've dialed the 10 digits, if you call in Switzerland, it will start uh, dialing. So how does it know that the number has ended? Because you could think, okay, it's always 10 digits, but no, it's not. If you call the police, it's 117, right? Internally at ETH, we have 888. We have internal numbers that have five digits, 21111. Right? And if you want to call external numbers, you add a zero. So this is variable length. So it means that in our phones, we found a way that we deal with variable length and you still know what number to call. And what you want to avoid in there, you want to avoid that you have a phone number uh, of a certain length and a prefix of that phone number is also a valid phone number because then you have an ambiguity. Once you have dialed the prefix, you don't know if you should call that number or if you should wait until you finish another one. So the phone numbers are an example of code that is a prefix code. You never ever have a phone number that is a prefix of a different phone number. Right? This is exactly the reason for adding the zero here on top when you have an internal line. Who understands this? We are going to do exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same idea. We want to avoid prefixes. And you know what's cool about these phone numbers? I, we don't even use that, I think, with phones, but we could actually do that, is that we can actually append phone numbers like this, and if I give you a string of phone numbers, you will be able to retrieve them. And why? Precisely because you have this property here, that you never have a prefix. So if you start here, you see it's a zero, so you know you're, you're leaving ETH, and then you have some number on 10 digits, because you don't have a zero, zero that would exceed Switzerland. You would have triple zero for exceeding Switzerland. So you know you count 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. And it stops here. And you know that you have to stop here, right? So, oh no, sorry, I got it all wrong. Because I wasn't assuming from ETH. I was assuming for a regular phone. So what's happening here is zero, zero, one. You're dialing the US from a regular phone. So, sorry about that, got it wrong. So you're dialing the US. Oh, it's California, 650. And then you have three more and four more, right? I should have used 555, five, five. forgot about that. But this gives you a number, then you cut, and then you know it's 1-1, one, one, so yeah, that's an emergency number, stops here, and here you have 044, four. that's the, the uh, standard number of ETH. So you know that just appending them, we know exactly how we retrieve, we retrieve them. This, this is the solution of the problem we have. We want to encode the postings in a way that we have a sequence of integers. We want to know exactly when they stop. This is a solved problem. We can just do a similar technique in there. What we need is a prefix code. We already have an example because the problem was also solved somewhere. Do you remember when I told you about the character encodings, UTF-8? This is a variable length encoding. The ASCII characters, they will just fit on eight bits right, the small characters in ETF-8, but as soon as you have some more complicated character, it's elastic, it will be encoding on several, on several uh, bytes in there, right, so pi is encoding that way, and remember, you probably remember that, we had the initial bits in every byte that were telling us if it stops or not, so if it starts with a zero, then we know we only have one byte, if it starts with 110, this means careful, we will have more bytes later. And then the 10 tells you it's the last one, right? So you do have a way here to encode, uh, to, to, to come up with a prefix code, because UTFS 8 is a prefix code. You can decode a UTF 8 document anonymously. How is it solved? We use the first bits of every byte in order to tell is it the last byte or not. So this is nice. We are, get, we are getting there. We are finding finding a way to do that. You can see here longer, and here, oh wow, we have something interesting here. You can see the continuing packets, this is actually how it works, we have one zero, and the first one, here it has two ones, tells us there's two packets, here it has three ones, tells us there's three packets. Can you see how we encode things? We are going to do something very similar, actually even simpler than that. So this is the idea. So how do we do it? First, the size of the packets, we don't care about it. I'm taking eight bits. I'm also going to show you an example with four bits. Doesn't matter, just make up your mind and pick one, right? So let's say we pick eight bit packets. 
so bytes. The idea is this. We have the first bit that tells us it's a continuation bit. It tells us it's the last bit, it's the last byte, it's the last packet, or it's not the last packet. So we reserve the first bit for that. And the other, the other bits, the n minus 1 other bits, so here it's 7 because n equals 8, encodes the integer. So how does it work? It's very easy. If there's less than 7 bits, we take 4, for example, binary 1, 1, 0, 0. We pad with zeros because we want the 7 bits, so I'm adding zeros here. And then, so I'm using that in order to encode, plus I'm adding a zero, and the zero is telling us it ends here. The zero is telling us that's all there is. It ends here. So when we see this beginning with a zero, we know that it stops here. Okay, who understands? Very good. And now, complicate it. We have 270, so I need to repad it. It's exactly the same number. I'm just adding a few zeros and organizing it in groups of seven, but this is just the same thing. Um, this is just to keep my sanity here. I mean, I group them in, in, in groups of uh, 16. So you can see this is 256, and then you add here this uh, 14. So here, this is the same thing, but with heading zeros and divided in groups of seven. And what do we do here? I write it down. What do I put here? What bit do I put? A, yes? A one, exactly, that's it. The one tells us it doesn't end here. That's not the last packet. And then the next packet has a zero, so it ends here. So now we know exactly where it ends. We found a way of having a prefix code, and we know exactly where it ends. So now we can just concatenate these things. We can concatenate these codes. We will know exactly where it ends. And so on and so forth. So if this is mo something more complicated, I already put it with zeros here and grouped it in groups of seven bits. That's it. You add ones to all the packets except the last one. And for the last one, you add a zero. That's how it works. So now, let's do it with the smallest integers, but with four bits, just in order to train you. Not eight bits, but four bits. So for zero, it's just zero, because that's only one packet, and then zero, zero, zero. And then it's easy, so from one to seven, we just encode it in binary, because it fits on three bits, four minus one, and then we have a zero. Um, can you give me the encoding of 8? What would be 8 encoded as? I need 8 bits. Can somebody give me the 8 bits to encode 8? Yes? Can you repeat, please? Almost, almost. This is exactly the idea. You're just swapping the, the semantics of the first bit. You're basically using zeros and as not ending and one as ending, right? But this is exactly the spirit. And it's arbitrary anyway. I mean, you could totally also use the opposite convention. But what happens here, we're using one first, one, zero, zero, one. Oh, sorry, what did you tell me? Where, was it this? I may have misunderstood you. Ah, okay, yes, I see, okay, yeah. Yes, we use four bit packets, exactly. So we need to encode eight, eight is one zero zero zero, so we are making packets of three, and then the first packet has the one to say it's the first packet, and zero because it's the last packet, and then, and so on, and it continues like this, and then that's it, just continues, okay? Could you encode, who will be comfortable in implementing that? Perfect, so you won't have to. I will ha ask you to encode the gamma, the gamma encoding instead. Um, so you can see that here it's on four bits, here it's on eight bits, and so on and so on. If it fits on three bits, then we're using one packet, on six bits, two packets, and so on. Okay. You can see that it takes, on average, 50% less space, um, this variable byte encoding. If you use, for example, compared to 32 bits, with all the numbers between zero and four billion, it takes half the space. So, very important, this is one of the properties of encodings, it is a parameterized encoding. You cannot just go ahead and use it. You need to first make up your mind what is the size of a packet. So you need to say, there's some paperwork to do, 
we've done it with n equals 8, then I show it, I showed it with n equals 4, you can have n equals 16, n equals 2, maybe n equals 2 is a bit ridiculous, but for mathematicians, you should always consider every case. Uh, and actually, any value of n uh, makes sense, but the reason why we only use these kind of values is because of the way that our machines work. The, the architecture of a CPU is organized in such a way that we like to have the boundaries every 8, every 16, every 32 bits. Okay, so this is a parameterized encoding. We will see that the one we see after that, the gamma encoding, has no parameters. That makes it very cool because you don't need any paperwork or any picking any parameters. But well, for this you do. Can you see that um, if you use a very large, a very large value for the packets, and you have small numbers, it's a waste of space because you have plenty of zeros everywhere. If, however, you pick a very small number, that's going to take more space because you're going to have half of the bits that are continuation, continuation flags and only half that encodes. So that multiplies the size by two, right? So it really depends on your use case and then you select the size of the packets. So here's an example on eight bits. So I know exactly where to find my flags. It's every eight bits, but I just need to determine what packets are grouped together. So you can see, it's very easy. When you see zeros, you know it's the last one. So you're looking for all the zeros. Zero, 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 that's the one, 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 one. Zero, so it ends here. Uh, and zero, so it's going to end somewhere here. Okay, so now we, find the, we found the limits. And then all we need to do is decode like this. I'm extracting, removing the flags, and that's it. And I decoded my gaps. Okay? So, again, there is no free lunch. We are compressing something. We are compressing the, uh, the, the, the postings list, which is a list of integers. But it's going to take more time in order to decode, right? So th this is a compromise to find. And as I told you, you can have bigger packets, but there is a little overhead. There's so not so much compression, but a little overhead. Uh, if you have very small packets, there is more compression, but you have a lot of bits to manipulate. So you need to make up your mind depending on your use case. Can we compress even more? Yes, we can, and I will show you how. But first, I have this little exercise for you. Because we are saying we are compressing, we are compressing uh, postings lists, right? So I'm giving you a compressed postings list, and I'm asking you what, is, what are the document IDs? So go ahead and tell me what the document IDs are. And I'm giving you the information. It's a parameterized, parameterized encoding, so I have to fill some paperwork here and tell you that the bits are grouped in four. So I'm using n equals four right here. If you're clever, you, because don't forget it's a multiple choice. So the best, of course, what I would love you to do is to actually decode it completely. But you can also be clever and just look at the answers that there are and eliminate them even faster, just looking at a few bits. But I, I'm not helping you too much. I'm just letting you try that. minutes for that. If you need a bit more time, nobody, let me show you. 14 ounces, very good. 17 ounces. Ha, ah, I got you. I got you. Do you remember what I told you a few minutes before? Who knows why this is the right answer? Who, who answered this correctly? Who is the one who gave that answer? Somebody gave that answer. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Nobody? Can you tell me whoever gave that answer why? Okay, so then somebody who, wants, who picked the second answer? Okay, so tell, tell me what you did. Well, 
so We'll come to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, I, I understand your reasoning. So now, can you redo it, but now not using the multiple choice thing and just decoding that? If you decode it without looking at the answers. One, so that's a one. Then? Yeah, we have two, and then? Yes, and then? Yeah. So you're, you're absolutely correct. This here is a variable byte encoding of the sequence of integers. Let me write it down. One, two, three, one, one. So I see why you selected answer two. But what was the one thing that was missing in there. I told you it's a variable byte encoding, so yes, the sequence of integers is fine, but what I want is the postings list. Do you remember how I told you we encode the posting list efficiently because it's a sorted list of document IDs? It's exactly. Yeah. Exactly. These are the gaps. So the first one, of course, is the first document ID, but the other ones are the gaps. Right? You can see why this is so efficient. Because imagine now that instead of encoding the gaps, you're actually encoding 1, 3, 6, 7, and so on. It takes more space. So you can see why encoding the gaps makes it shorter. So this is why the correct answer was the, the third one. You, you decode it correctly, but you need to remember that we encode the gaps. This is the one thing. But I'm very happy that you picked the correct answer still in terms of integers. So just remember we encode the gaps. It only works because we have increasing document IDs, of, co of course. Otherwise, we would have negative numbers. Can we compress even more? Can we do even better? Imagine that right now I told you we do packets, 8 bits, 4 bits, 2 bits, and so on. Can we do 1-bit packets? Can we compress so much that we get 1-bit packets? And actually, there is a way. It's called the gamma encoding. Um, Peter Ilias is the, uh, from MIT is the inventor of this encoding. Um, it's based on a unary code. So this is an encoding. Can you tell me how this encoding works? This is called the unary encoding. Yes? Exactly. So I'm encoding 12. So I'm putting 12 ones and one zero. That's pretty inefficient, right? But yeah, that's, that's an encoding like any other. Who thinks it's a prefix encoding? It's a prefix code? Can you append these things and still retrieve the integers? Yes, you can, right? You just need to find the zeros. And then the zero is the marker that it stops, right? So this is a unary code. Do you know another name for that? helping you. Well, I, I wish, I mean, I, I went once um, one floor down uh, trying to find Hervik and I see Hervik had to see a quick silver thermometer, but uh, that's all I found. So imagine that with your imagination that this is Mercury. Do you see it? This is exactly, it's called the thermometer encoding because it's exactly like you would have Mercury that uh, if you swap, like rotate it uh, clockwise, this is a thermometer. The longer the sequence of ones, the higher the temperature and the higher the integer. Who understands this? So just remember, unary encoding, thermometer encoding. This is the way you remember. We just use mercury to encode the ones. So 12 ones, perfect. And a zero to mark the stop. So of course, you imagine we are not going to just stay here. I mean, I could go ahead and use the unary encoding. Uh, but you can very easily see that if you want to encode uh, a very rare term associating with the posting list, and you need to encode, for example, there's the document number 2 billion that you have to encode, you are not going to store 2 billion ones in there. This is extremely inefficient, so don't be scared. We are not going to use that for the 
um, the encoding. But still, it's used in the gamma code. So this is it. These are the first integers in unary code. Here's an example on 8 bits. It's very easy to decode. Look for the zeros, gives you the limits. Then you decode, and that's it, right? But now, here's the gamma encoding. And I'm going to use the unary encoding in order to encode the gamma, to encode this with gamma. So here I, ha I have 18. Who can tell me? I hope I got it right. Who can tell me what 19 is in base 2 binary? Nineteen base two, yes. What is nineteen in base two in binary? Yes. Yes. Sixteen plus two plus one. So yes, you are correct, and that's the first step. So now, what are we going to do? We chop off the leading one, the most significant bit. We chop it off, and we only keep what's on the right of it. Right. So this, this I keep, and then. I'm going to encode the position here. It's position one, two, three, four. I'm going to encode the length. So there's four bits in there, and I'm using the thermometer encoding of this, uh, this length, right? So it's also the most significant bits. I know that some of my TAs love to explain it in terms of most significant bits. So here it's zero, one, two, three, four, and we encode four, we encode four in unary. And that's what we get for as a gamma encoding, right? So now if I just told you that, let me check. Uh, on the first integers, 0, 1, 2, 3, we have the decimals. We convert them to binary. Can you read? Who cannot read? Okay, you have them normally on the website as well. Then I chop off the leading bit, so I chop off the, the leading one. So I get 0 and 1 here for 2 and 3. Then I encode, uh, so I look for the length here of, the, uh, of, the, of, of this. So it has a length of 0 for the first one and 1 here. I encode it with the thermometer encoding. So it's longer, the longer the length, right? And then I get the gamma code by appending this and this. So this appendage with this. 1 is a special case. So 1 doesn't have any length. We're just encoding with a 0. So when you see a zero, that's the iconic for one. And zero doesn't have any encoding. So this is how we bootstrap it. Zero cannot be encoding, encode it. One is encoded with a zero. And then starting from two, we use the algorithm I gave you. Chop off the one, replace it with a unary encoding of the left. Okay? So then, if it continues, you will see that if you take the next four, the length will be two. So the thermometer is a bit warmer here. And then we are going to have Long, oh, what did I do here? It should be two ones. I will correct it. We just increase every time. How it goes. I will fix this. I think I got it wrong. So you can see that here, there's always longer and longer and longer sections, and the thermometer gets warmer and warmer every time, right? And every time, you chop off the leading one, you use it in the encoding, and replace the first one with an encoding of the length in the thermometer encoding. Yes? because it must be a prefix code, and we want to, to make it variable length. So let me, let me say it again, because this is an extremely important question. We could encode it in binary with a fixed length, right? Let me actually, I think I have a question about this. That is exactly your question. Let me check. Yes, that's actually exactly your question. So I'm very glad I have it here. So please answer this question. Why do we not just go ahead and encode them on fixed length binaries? Why is it? This is your question, right? In essence. So is it because we can only use blocks of 32 bits? Oh my, I made a typo. No, it's not. So is it because we can only use blocks of 32 bits and that's anyway the size of a, that a doc ID is encoded on? Is it because the distribution of gap sizes is skewed? 
do we actually use a fixed length encoding? Maybe this is all useless and I'm just talking for an hour for nothing because people use fixed length encoding in real life. Or is it because a fixed length encoding can only be used on secondary gaps, the gaps between gaps, because it can be centered around zero using an unsigned integer encoding? Who needs more time? Okay, let me show you the answer. This is the correct answer. Because the distribution of gap sizes is skewed. That's the reason. So, in short, um, imagine a setting where, and that's typical, there's a lot of very small gaps. For very frequent terms, the gaps will be one, two, three, maybe 10, and so on. Imagine if you encoded everything as a binary on 32 bits, the waste of space, because we'd have a lot of zeros and then a few ones to encode the gaps. If you imagine that I can do it on the blackboard. Um, if you have plenty of zero, imagine I have the gaps one, 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 one. I have only gaps of one. And I'm going to have 31 zeros and a one. Then 31 zeros and a one, and so on. That's taking a lot of space. Now I'm using the gamma code. What is the gamma code of one? It's zero. So this here is just this in gamma code. If I had a sequence of twos, then I would have one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero. So that's two, two, two in gamma code. It's just nine bits. Here, it would have been 32 bits times three, 96 bits, right? Does it answer your question? Okay. So it's really because we are trying to compress. So you want, you want something variable length, and this is why you use the gamma encoding. The unary encoding, I agree, is a waste of space. The gamma encoding wastes some space, but how much does it waste? How much longer is it than something optimal? Twice, right? Roughly, because your encoding, you, you can, if you look at here, it's roughly the original size. Here we had five bits. It's roughly the original size, but times two, right? Because the way you can actually see it, I mean, there's many ways of explaining the gamma encoding. And one of them is like this saying you encode the most significant bit in unary and so on. This is how I understand gamma encoding. I basically, it's a thermometer encoding that it starts with, right? So you just take the temperature here, look at the length, and you measure what is this length. I have here 68 centimeters, that's four ones. And I just measure it here as well. And this is where it stops, right? So what you have actually is that this length here is exactly the same as this, this length. So the zero here is always in the center, right? So this is why you can see that on average, you just multiply by two the length. You just double the length by having just as many ones here as you have bits in here, okay? Who understands gamma encoding? This is the one slide to remember, if at all, right? I will correct the one slide that I tried to give you the first integer is a bit flawed. I will correct it so that it's all correct, right? Don't be worried. Okay, so what are the properties? First, it's variable length. It's elastic, remember. The best compression is for one, just a sequence of zeros. It's a prefix encoding because you know where to stop. I showed you where to stop. You, you, you stop because you just measure the thermometer part and it stops with a zero and then report it and then you know that you cut right here and then comes the next integer. So it's a prefix encoding. And it's also a universal encoding. It's a universal encoding for two reasons it's used in two ways. First, it doesn't have any parameters. There are no parameters in there. That's just how you encode it, but we, are, we don't have packet sizes or anything. It's variable. The other one is that its length is actually optimal for any probability distribution of the integers. This is what is absolutely amazing. It's a universal encoding. So what does it mean to be optimal? Who knows about entropy? Some of you who doesn't? You all know, okay, so I can go very quickly. 
So the entropy is the, put roughly, is the expected amount of information that is contained. So the amount of information roughly can be measured in bits is the number of bits. And the amount of information is something that decreases with the probability. Because if something occurs with a probability of one, then you don't learn anything. When you see it occurring, you already knew it. If something occurs with an extremely small probability, right here, then that's a lot of information. That's a very large information. It's something extremely rare. And now somebody tells you something extremely rare happens. So you want to measure the expected amount of information that you learn with the random variable. And as it turns out, so this function must fulfill a few properties that are desirable. As it turns out, this is the one function that we love to use. This is the uh, minus the log of the probability. And then we take the expected value of that. And this is why we get that formula. And uh, the way it works, it's very simple. If you have something that is evenly distributed, then the, it's uh, the log of n, because you, you really have a lot of information. This is the maximum amount of information. And on the other side of the spectrum, if your probability distribution tells you its probability of 1 that this happens, the entropy is 0. OK? Who is up to date with this? You already know this, right? You've studied it. OK. Very good. Well, let me tell you now why it is optimal. We have this inequality here that the expected length of the gamma encoding, that's the expected length for a hypothetical probability distribution, the expected length is within a factor of 3 of the entropy. This is a constant. This is amazing. It's a constant, 3, which is the same thing here. And as it turns out, it's actually a factor of 2 if you tolerate that here I add a small offset. So you can see this is absolutely amazing. And the 2 here is very intuitive because I already showed you with the meter that it doubles the size of where the information is, which is in the, in the bits on the right. So this is one factor from being optimal. And that's really amazing. So I will continue some computation now to say you how much we compressed. But this part of the course is actually almost over. I introduced all the encodings. I showed you how to compress dictionaries, how to compress posting lists, and so on. So last week, I will finish by showing you some calculation like how much did we actually compress it using this technique. And then we'll move over to something, to the next topic, which is ranked retrieval with the vector space model. So I, I will stop right here and just ask you how much you understood. Also just, this is a, another kind of thermometer. How much of today's lecture did you understand? Very good. Oh, wow, somebody understood everything. Who is this? I really like that. This is nice. Oh, somebody no longer understood everything. OK, you, you go and hide. <laughs> That's a nice feature. I didn't know you could withdraw, withdraw an answer in there. OK, anyway, uh, thank you very much. Just a tiny announcement with the exercises. Who uh, so we have this system with the bonus points, and a lot of you gave exercises. For whom did it remove stress because it feels you're prepared for the exam? Some of you. For whom did it add stress? Who was a bit stressed because of that? Some of you. So I'm going to take it from there. Basically, I, I have the feeling that it produced a bit of stress because you, you submitted every week because we didn't announce in advance what weeks we are going to take. Well, we are going to change that. So here's what we are going to do. We are going to take, amongst what you submitted, we will announce what week we pick, amongst what's already been submitted, and then we will tell you, you, you validate that week or not. For the future, we will have two more weeks, but this time we will tell you in advance the two weeks, the two more weeks that we will look at the exercises, and that will remove stress, because then in the weeks that we don't, then you, you, you will feel less pressure to do the exercises. Who feels it will help in terms of stress? OK, so we will do that. So I, I can already tell you the one week, uh, the future week where we will look is the one starting right now with the gamma encodings. And the second week that we will look at is the uh, space uh, two weeks later for the uh, vector space model. Right? So yes? Can we know which of the previous week was looked at? 
we will announce it. The TAs are still looking, are still looking into it. So they will, they will announce it, they will make their choice. We will announce it ASAP so that you already know before next week what, what we will do. So you will know if you already have one or not. But in the future, do not worry, we will t I already told you the two weeks that we will estimate, so the, the exercise sheet distributed today, and then two weeks later, and that's it. And that should remove pressure off you. This is the meaning of that. The, the whole point of doing that with the bonus points is to help you, to give you feedback on your learning and to remove pressure from you so that you can learn in good conditions. Okay, so very good. So uh, enjoy the exercise session today, and I will see you next week uh, at 10, at 9, at the same time for uh, uh, the next lecture on ranked retrieval. Thank you.